So in my last video, I told you all about the structure of DNA, but that doesn't really show you why it's so important or how it's a secret of life. So in this video, we're gonna learn and see how these bases, these A's, T's, C's and G's are actually a code to build proteins and how that process works using other nucleic acids called RNA to facilitate it. So more specifically, in this lesson, you're gonna cover what a gene is and how it works. We're gonna look at the structure of messenger RNA and the structure of transfer RNA. And we'll explain the processes of transcription and translation, which is essentially protein synthesis and, and what DNA is used for. And then we're gonna learn specifically about the genetic code and how that code actually works. So the genetic code. So the sequence of bases in DNA is actually a code to make proteins. We've already explained just how vital proteins are to living organisms, okay? Proteins are the building blocks of cells, while DNA are the instructions to build those proteins. And machinery in cells can read this genetic code and then manufacture the protein, and that process is called protein synthesis. Now, every three bases on the DNA codes for an amino acid. Okay, so you look at the sequence, A's, T's, C's, G's, you know, be A, T, T, G, C, G, 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 C. You pay the first three, maybe it's T, T, A. That is the code for one amino acid. We call that the triplet code. Now there are 64 combinations of bases, if you think about it, but there's only 20 amino acids. So there is actually more than one triplet code for each amino acid. We therefore say that the code is a degenerate code, this idea that we've actually got more combinations of bases than we need for the amino acids. Another thing about the code is it's what we call non-overlapping. This is because you read three, and then the following three, and then the following three. It was thought at one point that you'd read the first three, uh, say, uh, you know, base one, two, and three, and then you'd read base two, three, and four, and then you'd read base three, four, and five, and so it'd be an overlapping code but that is not how it works. The fact that the code is a degenerate code is a good thing, because what it means is that if you get a mutation, if you get a small change in the DNA sequence, if one of the bases changes, it might actually have no effect at all because it will still code for the same amino acid. So it actually gives a bit of inbuilt flexibility for mutation without huge changes always happening. DNA structure is the same in all living organisms. The triplet code works the same in all living organisms. This is fantastic, this is universal, this is why it's so incredible. This is why DNA is so important to understanding biology because it's universal, because it works the same whether you're a carrot or whether you're an elephant, okay? The sequence is the, the code, the language is the same, it's the same basis, it's just a different order. The order of the basis will determine what proteins are made and whether you end up being a carrot or whether you end up being an elephant. And the cool thing about that, also, it means scientists can swap bits around. We can take sections of DNA called genes, transfer them from one organism to another. And you'll learn more about that when you learn about genetic modification in this course. So what exactly is a gene? How do you define that term gene? Well, a gene is a section of DNA that codes for a specific protein. Or, if we're gonna be more detailed about it, a gene is a sequence of bases on a DNA molecule coding for a sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. The cell knows when to start reading the gene at a particular triplet code. This is called the start codon. And once it reaches a triplet, that means uh, the, it's a stop, the stop codon, then it will finish reading that gene and that will have manufactured one protein. Okay, so for example, here is a gene, there's a start codon and there's the stop codon and that whole sequence of bases will code for the protein. The process of how DNA is read and then a protein assembled has been simplified up until this point. Okay, we've said you read it in threes and you make a protein. But now we're gonna go into more detail as exactly how that process works of protein synthesis. And you can split it into two stages, transcription and translation, okay? Transcription is when you take the DNA, which is located inside the nucleus, and you copy that code. The DNA is a huge long molecule and you can't have that leaving the nucleus, moving into the cytoplasm, which is where we make proteins, okay? That would be, a, that, that's not possible. 
So what happens instead is that that particular code, that particular gene code is copied. And it's copied into a similar molecule called, to DNA, which is called RNA. RNA is another nucleic acid. It's very similar to DNA apart from three key differences. One, it's single-stranded and not double-stranded. Two, it's got a different sugar. It's got ribose and not deoxyribose. And three, it doesn't have thiamine. It has a base called uracil instead. And in fact, there are actually three types of RNA we're going to be looking at during this lesson. Messenger RNA, which we're going to look at first, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA. So going back to transcription, here is the DNA, let's say inside the nucleus, all right? And we only want to read one gene, one section of it. So the first thing to do is to break the hydrogen bonds that are joining the two strands together for that particular gene. And to do that, you need to use something called RNA polymerase, the enzyme, okay? And then the RNA polymerase, as well as breaking open the strand, it goes along and it forms a complementary RNA strand called messenger RNA. And it'll be the exact complementary base. So on the DNA strand, if you have a C, then there'll be a G on the RNA strand. It only reads one side, which we call the antisense strand. So if you have a C on the DNA, you'll have a G on the RNA. If you have a, a T on the DNA, you'll have an A on the RNA. The only difference, remember though, is that RNA does not have thiamine. So if you have A on the DNA, you'd have a U, uracil instead, on the RNA. Now, the beauty of this is that once you've done that copy, the DNA can coil back up again and it's just stored there. I like to think about it a bit like a library, okay? You've got some very expensive books in the library. You're not allowed to take it out of the library, okay, and take it home with you. That's a bit like DNA. The DNA is stored in the nucleus library. But what you can do is you're allowed to go in and you can take a photocopy of the relevant page. And that's what RNA does. It, go, it, it creates a photocopy of the code and then that can move through the nuclear pores that surround the nucleus into the cytoplasm for the second stage of protein synthesis to take place, okay? And that is called translation. Now for translation, we need to look at our other two types of RNA that we mentioned, ribosomal RNA and transfer RNA. Ribosomal RNA forms something called a ribosome. Now this little thing is going to actually read the RNA code. This is what does the work. This is the little machine that assembles our protein. A ribosome is made from ribosomal RNA and protein itself and it reads the code. It reads the code, uh, the messenger RNA code, three bases at a time. Now we called three bases on the DNA a triplet, but three bases on RNA, messenger RNA, is called a codon. So it's gonna read a codon at a time. Then we need the other bit of machinery here, the other type of RNA, which is called transfer RNA or tRNA. Now these things are found free in the cytoplasm. They've got this lovely clover leaf shape, uh, which is held together by hydrogen bonds. And there are three complementary bases at the bottom that match to the corresponding messenger RNA codon. We call these three bases the anticodon, okay? They match the codon and at the top of the transfer RNA, you have three exposed bases, which is the amino acid binding site. And a particular amino acid will be bound there for that transfer RNA. So each transfer RNA with its special anticodon will have a particular amino acid that corresponds up there at the top. So if you bring all this together, you've got the ribosome. It reads the codon, the first codon, and it, the correct transfer RNA will come in and bind with the corresponding anticodon. That will bring in our first amino acid to build our protein. You then need the same thing to happen on the second codon, and then those two amino acids can bond together, forming a peptide bond, condensation reaction, and that first transfer RNA is then free to be released and to pick up another amino acid and to be used again in protein synthesis later on. And the ribosome moves along and it reads next codon and the next codon, and then transfer RNA comes in and they bring in more amino acids and they join together and you start this little assembly line where you build the protein, which remember is built according to the messenger RNA code, which is a copy of that original DNA code. Now at this point, we've only got our primary protein structure, which is one long line of amino acids. So they need to go off to the Golgi apparatus where they're gonna get folded into their 3D tertiary shape. 
the uh, messenger RNA is released by the ribosome and can be reused, and the ribosome will also be able to start the process then all over again. Now you can see what amino acids a section of messenger RNA would code for by using this wheel. You can look at it and work from the middle outwards and you can check your codon. So if your RNA codon is GUC, you're going to get the amino acid valine. And that's it. That's biology. That's how it works. This is the most fundamental process in biology, really. It's amazing. In some ways, it's so incredibly simple that you think that this is how all life is built in biology. It's the central concept of biology that you need to really make sure you understand well.